Right, Rick, you chose this car in 1955 yeah. at Armstrong Sidley. Right, yep. first question, why? Why this one? Of all the cars? Because it's one of the few cars I've not driven in my life. I'm a car fanatic, as, as you know. Yeah. I've, I've, I've tried to drive all sorts of things. I, I started driving in, in the mid-60s, so I had a lot of cars from the 50s and from the 40s, because that's what us kids bought back then. And this was a car that there were a few around, and you saw them and you thought, that's a pretty car, but it was something you could never afford and you couldn't really aspire to because you couldn't afford it. Um, but my barber, uh, it's a bit of a contradiction in terms, I had a, I had a, <laughs> I had a, I had a barber uh, up the top of Sudbury Hill where I, where I lived and I, it was about a mile walk up there and he had one of these, but he had the one with the, with the uh, glass partition. Okay, yeah. Uh, which, which he bought, which that was a pre-select. And he had that, and occasionally he would, he, he would stop if I was walking up there to get the bus to go to school. He would stop and say, "Do you want a lift?" Uh, and I used to get in, and he'd, he'd give me a lift. And what, what I, and I was fascinated with the pre-select box. This is a, this is a, a, yeah. a, a, a straight box. Yeah. But I was fascinated with the box, this pre-select box. But actually, showed me how it worked. That, and he said, and that was the first time I used it. He said, "This is what buses have." And I, well, and I was fascinated with that. So, uh, so is that why you chose this car? Yeah, I chose this car because it was a car that I, I loved. Uh, I, I saw it. There were a few about, mm. you know, so, and the model that came before that with I the mean, great this, big sphinx. This on would the have front. been a car, though, for a, a wealthy or for you know for a, a well-to-do couple, wouldn't it? Or man or, or yeah, you right? got it. Yeah, got it. Yeah, it's trying. Yeah, there you go. There you go. That's part of the charm of a classic car. Isn't oh, it? absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I got to add a bit of that. Yeah, uh, but it's uh, oh yeah, this was this was. Um, I, I, I hate to say it's the wrong expression really, but one step down from a, you know, from a from a Bentley, from an early S1 or an yeah. R type, yeah. like, as it was then. Or a, a, yeah. the thing is, you're obsessed with Rolls Royces, right? You've always had this thing for Rolls Royce, and um, yeah, I love that obsession of yours. But I do want to know why. Why did you choose? What is it about a roller? Um, I suppose it stems from my dad. My dad was very British. He only ever owned British cars. Right. Uh, he 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 really was. British through and through. Uh, anything that wasn't made in Britain was rubbish. You'd never have a German car. Was it one of those where your dad was like, son, you know when you made it when you've got a roller? It was to some extent. He said, you know, <laughs> buy a Rolls Royce one day, son. He said, that if you can. And, uh, and how many you had? Over the years? Uh, 70 or 80, I suppose. 70 or 80 Rolls but Royces. I have to say, the, the reason for that is, um, I. I started a car company called the Fragile Car Company because I couldn't bear to sell a car. Right. <laughs> so it was a great friend I've of mine. I've got that disease. Have you? <laughs> yeah, oh, exactly, well, dude. I've got 12 old bangers all rotting away. Yeah, he, he, uh, So this friend of mine, he said, look, I'll tell you what, he, said, he had a garage, yeah. a mechanic. He, he said, I'll look after them. Well, rent them out, get some chauffeurs in. He said, then you win because you don't have to sell the car because it's your car. Um, and I said, great. And I just kept buying them. And uh, when they came up, I just kept buying this car. And we had them in the Fragile Carriage Company. And it was mis misread in the press sometimes. They would say, oh, Rick's, as one says, they wrote, oh, Rick's got 22 Rolls Royces and nine, nine Bentley's. Yeah, but that's the way it was. Rock and Roll Stars it then was, had these cars. But it they? was true. I did have, but they were all in the company. Right. You know, but I used to go down and just drive whatever I fancied driving at the what time. What a life. I, mean, I, I, I bet you pinched yourself, didn't you? I bet it was like... Oh, yeah. This, Absolutely. This, this, there, was, there was, I mean, I had some... I bought Clark Gable's Clark Gable's Clark Gable's 1957 Cadillac limo and shipped wow. that back. I just, I just love cars. They had to be pretty though, and the, I think one of the things that I liked about Rollers and, and Bentleys was they were pretty. The yeah. same with Jags. Yeah, I loved beautiful. Jags. Yeah. I liked pretty cars, uh, and it was also that great period of time through. As I saw, you know, started driving in the six, the early sixties, and so you bought cars from the fifties and forties because that's what you could afford. Yeah. Yeah. But they were so individual. They were so recognisable as to what they were. Did you? Would you say, to some extent, you maybe started the ball rolling for the other rock and roll stars to actually? Because there were a lot of yeah. photos early days of like the Beatles, uh, Bowie, yeah. and stuff with rollers. Is that anything to do with you? I didn't have anything to do with the Beatles buying rollers. But John Lennon had a had a a, a, a Cloud Three yeah. that he famously painted the psychedelic colours. Uh, I, I did sell a lot of. A lot of rollers to a lot of uh, rock and roll musicians. Roger Daltrey had some off me. From The Who. From yeah. The Who, yeah. And so did John Entwistle, who had four cars off me, who interestingly couldn't drive. 
He said, I drink too much to drive, so it's safer I don't. Right. So, uh, you mentioned John Lennon there. Am I right in yeah. thinking that you were actually, weren't you having lunch with John Lennon two days before he sadly was, got yeah, shot? In, in New York, yeah, yeah. I had, I had, it wasn't a deliberately planned lunch. I was in New York at a place called Tavern on the Green and he was at the next table with, with Yoko. And I'd never met him before. And, and you do that sort of nodding thing, you know. Yeah, to, yeah, and yeah. He, he, he came wandering over, just sat down and we talked for about two hours. And then uh, two days later, he was murdered. It was uh, shocking, which was, yeah. yeah. It, but um, but I, yeah, I just, I, I did turn a lot of people on to, to rollers and Bentleys. I mean, you've had a lot of beautiful cars, but yeah. I hear that you've also lost a lot of beautiful cars. You've had some yeah. tough times when, and for, for an out and out petrol head, for you losing cars must have been pain, pure it's pain. It's really, I mean, one of the great things about that period when I had a, when I had a fragile, um, I don't like going in the second very much. Uh, when I had the Fragile Carriage Company, what was great is I didn't have to sell any cars. So they were all, and they were all looked after, they were maintained, and the, and the rental with the drivers used to, used to cover the cost. Yeah. So that was what was fantastic, you know. Uh, so, but then the, the problem came, it was mixed with divorces and other various bits and pieces, that they, they had to go. And that was really hard, I mean, I had, I had a, a, a wonderful XK150S, which I absolutely loved, which was... We'll just wait for these cars to go, okay. we'll, we'll do that, because I want to know the story about the 150S. Yeah. Ooh, four-door Aston, you see that? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I had a... I, I, I bought a 150S, which was... The XK150S. XK150S, yeah, which beautiful were quite drag. rare, because it was... It, it was the uh, convertible where they had, where the uh, where the hood actually went into the bodywork, right. covered up. It was the and the slightly bigger engine, uh, and I I had that, and it was it was unusual because it it was right hand drive, very low mileage, but had a, a kilometre um, okay, yeah, yeah. and it was it had three owners, which was Sterling Moss. Wow. The second owner was John Bonham, right. drummer of Les, <laughs> and I was the third owner. Wow. Three and legends. I, and I lost the <laughs> car. Oh, it was, oh, it was a beautiful car. And I lost that. That, that went in, in the divorce. And that, I, I suppose it, that really upset me more than losing houses. <laughs> uh, did it really? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I loved that car. And I, have, you ever, have you ever cried due to the loss of a car? Uh, yeah, Physically uh, cried? Well, I, I think I, it's going back many, many years now, but I think, I think there was a tear shed when that went. And I also had a boat tailed Tora Phantom that was owned by Henry Royce. Wow. His name was on wow. the bar. I lost that. That ended up in South Africa in a museum. That was really, really sad. I mean, you for know. you, you have, there have been some times in your life because you've had an incredible journey. And, and to be honest with you, many of your, uh, your friends who are megastars in their own right are no longer with us. Right? No, uh, yeah. What is the key for you to life? How are you still here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a very, uh, generally there's a few things. Is first, I mean, I was, I was, a very heavy drinker. Yeah. I did enjoy a drink, I must admit. Uh, but I became pretty ill with it. And in 1985, I was told, if you don't stop, you will die. And I thought, and that was, a, I suppose, one of the first things I thought, well, do you know what, I really like life. Yeah. Uh, I've got so many things to do, I like, love doing. No. So I stopped. And I stopped in August 1985, and I've never drunk since. But I think, this might sound weird, my saving grace, or anything else was, I never, uh, I never took any drugs in my life, never popped a pill, right. never smoked a joint. And the, the reason for that is that I have an excessive nature. Uh, it's like with keyboards on stage, yeah. I've, I've got 24. You know, I don't have two, I have to have 24 <laughs> cars. Why not? Cars. Because you can. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and cars, <laughs> I've always had a handful of cars, I've got seven at the moment, so I just love the cars. How many cars have you had in your life, you reckon? Uh, over 200, right. I know that. But a lot of <laughs> that is head. a lot of that is down to the fragile carriage standard. But I've had right. I've had all sorts of of, of, of cars, though, and I've been involved with garages and things. It's just yeah. wonderful. Uh, it's what I what I what I really love. But um, I knew because of my excessive nature that if I got on the road of even smoking a joint, I would end up going down the whole the hog. Yeah. I would I would have ended up. And just because of my nature, you know, oh, well, I'll try heroin, you know, go right there. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I wouldn't be here talking to you now. What would you say in your life then have been the most sort of iconic, if you had to sum your life up on a post-it note of the most incredible things you've done, personal achievements, but you're not allowed a, a massive long page of I've done this, this and this, you had to choose your like top three 
days in your life, trigger moments you'll just never forget. Well, that's that's there's a there's a lot of to, that I suppose. Um, I, I mean, doing the Hollywood Bowl was a was a big moment. Walking, well, I, I tell you, I did. Hollywood Bowl was a big moment doing that. I've done that a few few times. That's a, was that with yes? Uh, no, that was with myself. With, okay. uh, when I did Journey to the Center of the Earth. Yeah. But there are two. If you want to say there are two moments that that really made an impression on me, I was the first Western actor uh, to go and play in um, South America, right, right. In Brazil, and uh, it's it the days when nobody could go down there. Nobody knew what was going on, and uh, so I, I went down there, and, and I was. Truly, when we arrived there, it was massive. There were a hundred thousand people at the airport. You know, this is nineteen seventy. Yeah, and it was absolutely <laughs> nuts. I had bodyguards, arm guards. Uh, it was just absolutely preposterous. And we were playing two shows a night, thirty-five thousand people a night, two shows. It was absolutely phenomenal. We were there for two weeks. Uh, uh, my guide to take us around was Ronnie Biggs. He, he was, what, he, the great train robber? Yeah, he, he, he turned up and said, oh, he said, I'll show you around, Rick. And he was, it, it was bizarre. And we couldn't go anywhere without guards and things. It was just nuts. And so we all got a bit, wow, this was with my own band. We were doing Journey to the Centre of the Earth and King Arthur. We thought, wow, this is, this is something else. And we, 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 I suppose egos grew like yeah, there was yeah, no but, tomorrow. And we, we flew back and we had to, our next shows were in Sweden. And we arrived in Sweden. And, and we're in this small club, and there was about 60 people. We've been playing 35,000 two shows a night. Stadium and there was about, yeah, yeah. And there were 60 people, and uh, and we used to be walking on stage and being unable to play for five minutes because of the noise. And we walked on to a few glasses, chicken <laughs> in Sweden. It's like, Hello. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and it was it was funny. And we played the same set. Yeah. And it went down okay, but it was 60 people as yeah. against 35,000. And we came off, and I said, my drummer Tony went, that's how to come back down to earth. <laughs> and I said, so there were two sort of like strange iconic moments that right. happened one after the other that I'll, that I'll never forget.